Welcome to Forward Filmmaker, a podcast from Film Hub. I'm Max Sanders. You may know me from my podcast, Buzz in the Tower, where I discuss my favorite 80s films. But this one is different. The film industry is changing, and filmmakers must adapt. On Forward Filmmaker, we'll be talking with directors and producers about the pains and opportunities facing the modern filmmaker. Joining me today is Torsten Hoffman. Torsten is an award-winning filmmaker with a background in distribution and entrepreneurship. Having lived and worked on four continents, he is passionate about where technology meets art and media. His current feature documentary, Cryptopia, has won 16 international festival awards, is available on VOD and large broadcasters. This podcast is brought to you by Film Hub the number one film distribution platform. Join thousands of filmmakers who are keeping their rights and getting paid on time. Submit your film today at filmhub.com and have it streamed on Amazon Prime Video, IMDb TV, Tubi, the Roku Channel, Plex, and dozens more. Torsten, how are you today? Very well. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's my honor. I'm excited to learn all about the crypto field. Your films, Cryptopia and Bitcoin, The End of Money as We Know It, tackle these really dense kind of subject matters. Where does your passion for explaining such complex topics come from? Yeah, no, I think my, my passion is about these topics first and for, foremost, right? And then I tried with my first film, that was my, my first try, uh, to to explain things that People have been asking me, right? Or I asked myself uh, researching this. I guess I got a little bit better along along the way. And then my newer film, Cryptopia, is uh, you know, five years later. And hopefully I would have still learned a little bit more, big, bigger budget, better animations. Right. Um, but, but I think that's where it comes from. So, um, and, and you know, nowadays there's so many good um, YouTube tutorials or even like things like Explained on, on Netflix. I don't know whether you know that. that sure. Series, but, but it is like uh, there's so much good um, explainer type of, of content out there. And I'm, I'm sure I probably took some tricks from, from experts going into these movies did you have a plan for getting these intricate topics and diluting them down to the basics yeah well um all right so um let's maybe take a step back so sure. um <laughs> 2013 i find out about bitcoin and and the penny drops and i i kind of get it because of my financial background i, I might have gotten it a little bit faster than other people because usually when you first hear about it right it's must be a scam it can never po- possibly work you know what is this crazy internet um uh, magic money right but we, along the way it kind of became clear that I actually needed to make a, a, a documentary about money and how money works or doesn't work, about how the banks, uh, you know, like kind of, uh, you know, screw us in some uh, um, uh, cases, or about central banking, how money is created out of thin air. Only then does Bitcoin make sense. And so I kind of try to break that down in my first film. Yeah. So did you find by the second film you had more kind of in your repertoire when it came to graphics, when it came to music, when it came to what words to explain uh, worked better? Yeah, for sure. Um, but at the same time, things got more complicated because uh, first film is just explaining Bitcoin, which is complex enough, right? And, and, and the money creation. And the second film, five years later, this whole blockchain economy uh, appeared, right? There's millions of other coins. So it's like, uh, okay, how does it actually work? What is a smart contract? So the topics got, got, got more difficult, but at the same time, hopefully my toolkit also maybe improved a little bit. The budget improved and more collaborators on that project as well. And did you test it on any sample audiences that didn't know about Bitcoin? I did. Um, I tried try to do it scientifically, you know, there's this, um, what's this called? Um, the, the marketing people always use these uh, feedback forms and then you get the score. Um, the, the more likely you're, you, you, you get certain scores, the better, be, you know, better it performed. And I think Hollywood does this uh, like to a, to a high degree. I kind of try to do this a little bit and also have like a circle of, I don't know, 10, 20 people. I always, um, check back in with, right. The script and then the animation and then look, I didn't quite understand this and that, but it's, that one wasn't quite uh, as sophisticated. It was more like, let's say five of my friends you know, giving, giving me feedback. You have such a unique background for a filmmaker. Where did you get the inspiration to get behind the camera? So at the time, um, I had started a business, a distribution business, 2012. So at the time, 2014, 15, I would have worked with maybe a hundred different content makers or maybe, maybe 50, I, I don't know, from all over the world. And um, 
what kind of struck me is um, being on the distribution end, right? Some films perform super well. Some other films do not do not perform well at all, right? Mm-hmm. And then also, what does the market want? What does a, a Netflix acquire? What does a, um, a you know broadcaster in America or in, in, in Euro bond? So I kind of, I, I thought I my, my unique angle is like, okay, I think I can make something that an audience might actually watch. Um, so that, that was, I think, the, the beginning. And then with Cryptopia, actually, um, that is the next evolution. So it's not like what the marketplace, the broadcasters want, because I found out that's actually only a small part of the pie, right? The, the, the big money you can make on the digital platforms. Um, and I use a film hub, but there, there's others as well. So you have to create like an audience yourself um, and, and like target uh, someone, uh, hopefully a big audience who really um, is totally attuned to what, what you're making, right? Did you find at the core of your filmmaking, it was kind of audience retention and distribution was kind of a, a more important focus than normal creative directors that who start out that way? I, I think so. I mean, it's always hard to, hard to compare, but I don't, uh, for me, the creative comes last and, and the audience building and the positioning and the, the, the marketing and the pitching comes kind of, kind of first. And to be honest, right, as a filmmaker, you have to start with an idea, with a pitch deck, with, uh, so I did two Kickstarters and I think you're going to ask me about that probably later. So, <laughs> oh, of course. So it is kind of like a lot of entrepreneurial steps anyway. Um, and, and then you also learn and adapt, right? And, and see what works. Um, and so relatively early, you kind of, I think, find your, your niche, find your story and then you just execute um, on that. So you have this background where you're ready to market, you're ready to distribute. Where did you learn to write, edit, and direct? Yeah, no, that that is uh, th- maybe you know, on paper my weak point, right? That's not <laughs> right. What I've, I've done before, I, I've you know, watched a lot of films, I've represented other filmmakers. So uh, what I did is I partnered with what I thought was the best filmmaker um, in, in my um, um, circle, and Michael is kind of a, a genius at this, and he co-directed and he edited it, and, and he coached me writing uh, the first one and the second one. Uh, I, I he again is a co-director, and I, I increasingly take a stronger, stronger role, and and am able to do more and more. I've never done the editing myself um so that's still not my my part of the the role but uh, writing producing directing uh, very much so have you reached out to other directors and asked for help? Yeah, I probably have two or three times. I, I might have or, or, or talk to someone at a conference or something. But but to be honest, um, out of a hundred, you know, little bits of inf- information or inspiration, sorry, um, you can watch it on the screen. You know, uh, 98% of what you see on the screen, you can kind of replicate or understand what it is. Maybe in 2% of cases, you want to know, okay, how did they actually do this? Or what was the budget behind that particular shot? So I think you don't actually need to, um, uh, uh, you know, have this, this kind of mentorship with a dozen um, directors in order to direct yourself, I don't think. What movie, when you saw it, you got that 98% and it really kind of helped you with your films? Well, there'd be so many. I mean, <laughs> you know, every other day you watch a documentary and think, oh, this was clever. And, and maybe the, the biggest ones, I mean, looking back and for sure, Inside Job, which won the Oscar yep. with about the financial crisis. And there's a few kind of like econom- economics, uh, financial uh, uh, bits. And there were, I think, two other Bitcoin related films that um, I went a complete different route, but I think um, those kind of types of content or even podcasts, okay, how do you explain Bitcoin? How do you explain the, uh, the blockchain, right? And after listening to 50, you know, different explanations, I kind of found, okay, I think I'm going to go this way, right? And I'm, I'm bringing in my own experience as well. In 2014 and 15, when you first started, you made your first movie. Was there a market for these crypto documentaries? Yeah, good question. I mean, there were two or three. Um, one was very much focused on the American landscape, which was interesting and very well made, but it wasn't the story I wanted to tell. At the, at the time, it was based in Australia. I had lots of production in Europe as well, so so I wanted to tell an international story. And um, then there was another one that was focused on mining, um, so the mining of Bitcoin, which even in 2014-15 was already not consumer. F- I mean, with a laptop, you can't really make, you know, uh, money, even back then. Um, so, so it was kind of, I thought that was a, almost like too quick to be outdated. And I went a completely different route. So the first film is really about money, right? And that doesn't change because the history of money is like thousands of years old or hundreds of years old. And in my second film, I think suddenly this whole industry has emer- had emerged, like hundreds uh, or thousands of projects around this whole technology had, had emerged. So I, I wanted to cover that wider ecosystem. And, and again, I think both films in that way were kind of unique. And, and yeah, I was, I was um, making my own um, niche. So you talk about making it an international story. Were you always set on that or was you just wanted to tell the world so the globe could understand the stories? Wow, that's a very good question. Um, so so maybe I should say something um, uh, um, 
different first. So there are different kinds of um, filmmaking, right? So I just watched the the, the um, three-parter a documentary about uranium. It's called Uranium Twisting the Dragon's Tail or something like that. Fantastic production. And it was, they went to Chernobyl and, and Japan, like all over America, everywhere, and Australian production, actually. And Literally every little sentence was pre-scripted and very well executed. So basically they were, they were shooting to script, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you can do that. And they did a fantastic job. My process is slightly different. I, I went to the first conference in January, 2014 in Miami. And I, I finished maybe a year later in, I don't know, Tokyo or wherever the last shoot what I was. I don't remember. Um, and along the way, I keep learning. I keep meeting new people and I, I should go down this way more, this way. So I, I kind of keep evolving. When I start a project, I kind of know, okay, most of the action is in America or, or, mm. or I want to talk to these agents, right? But I don't actually know in advance. So so that's the first part of the of the answer. The other uh, part of the answer is definitely the international angle. So even though America still represents the largest audience, and I think like in, in terms of VOD, it's probably 80% of, of the audience, right? But for TV... Um, I mean, I'm just just looking at at my chart here for Cryptopia. Um, and we have um, let's see: Slovenia, Croatia, Norway, Hong Kong, Israel, Australia, Poland, South Korea, Germany. That was a pre-sale. Russia, and then Al Jazeera English, Al Jazeera Arabic. Um, starting from small to the biggest broadcasters uh, with hundreds of millions of people. So, and you, you don't find a single American uh, broadcaster there, right? So, mm. would those broadcasters have acquired the film, licensed the film, if I had only made it in America for Americans? How did you get these two projects off the ground so that they could, you know, be shown all over the globe? Yeah, um, and and I might be different here to other filmmakers. I, I really am um, very much focused on that kind of entrepreneurial um, way of, of filmmaking. So I put my own money first, my own time, you know, maybe six months sometimes, um, and and create a trailer at least uh, on, on my own dime, right? That's maybe two or three production days. At least I have some content, I have a, a rough idea. And then in both cases, I went to um, a Kickstarter. Um, Kickstarter is a full time job for two months. It, yep. It's really you can't do anything else. <laughs> and and in both cases, I was uh, successful. I had another Kickstarter as well for a different project which was successful and one other failed one and what i learned is the more you have you know in the can and like you can show the more successful it will likely be and then you know you have to have a large platform and, and, and people who, who will help you um spread the message um and then with the second one it, it got easier because then i i had the first one to prove look there's an audience i know how to tell to reach that that audience yeah people respect me in that community and then for the second one i was able to get screen australia um, um funding i don't, don't remember how much maybe a third of the funding came from them i had a german a broadcaster a pre-sale that might have been um, I don't know, I'm guessing now maybe 15% of the budget, right? So, so you just add, add on these, these, um, um, uh, uh, capital. In the second movie, is that how you got such larger than life, big presence in the crypto community? You had the creator of Litecoin. Did you use the experience from the first movie to kind of get your way in the door? Yeah, for sure, for sure. I mean, even even the so I was lucky twice. So the, in 2014, the industry was so small, uh, mm -hmm. you know, nothing was covered in the mainstream media. Everyone wanted to talk about it, you know, and, and sell me uh, the, that vision that Bitcoin is going to replace the US dollar in 2014. So it was easy to get people back then, right? But then by 2020, these guys are all billionaires, so it's hard to get interviews. Sure. But I I, I could I could basically prove. Look, this film has reached I don't know uh, 12 broadcasters or whatever that, that number was. It was very big um, on on the internet on many platforms. So it's it's kind of um, easy easy for me to convince them to, 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 you know, join my next film. Yeah. Did you have any favorites? Oh, I mean, all these guys are super smart and uh, yeah. very, very uh, friendly and, and, and nice uh, and nice to meet. I mean, one of my favorites was uh, Laura Shin because she's also a journalist. She's a podcaster, very knowledgeable. And I kind of um, got to, you know, pick her brain a little bit of, you know, how, how she manages to kind of remain neutral, friendly, but neutral, you know, not yeah. too friendly uh, with, with people. So so I really like that one. She, she shares some great stories. She's a very respected journalist and she's uncovered some, you know, big scams and, and big, big stories in the crypto community. Yeah, for sure. You know, you've diluted this material down so that the normal person can understand them. Who do you create these films for? Yeah. So directly picking up from my last answer, right? So a, a podcast is, is a, or a vlog on, on, on YouTube, right? Is a weekly um, summary of what's going on. So it's like, like, you know, live, live reporting on something. What we as documentary makers uh, make is, is almost the opposite, right? We spend two years on making something that's hopefully um, still accurate and valuable two years later, or even like my first film is now six, seven years old. Um, so, so you need to you need to really um, think about the story and what are the main 
trends and 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 f- philosophies behind it stuff that doesn't go outdated after you know a, a year or two and especially for for bitcoin and crypto and blockchain that is stuff that moves so quickly so you have to be very careful about that um and then to answer um your question look i mean i know this community i'm part of this community right i i, mm. I i'm really part of, of, of this group and i can imagine um these people trying to for the hundredth time explain to their uh you know friend or partner or a, a colleague or ex uh, you know roommate or whatever uh, th- this topic and and i i kind of imagine that the community that i know is going to be kind of like my inner circle of people who then bring it to the, to their circle circle you, you know what i mean what i'm trying to say so yeah. it's like they are my uh, evangelist uh, so, so to speak and sure. that, that's how you reach an audience much larger than the actual crypto community So do you think that applies to pretty much any kind of filmmaker to like find those people around you that are your apostles and have them go out into the world? I think that's a general um, rule for for marketing or for uh, online um, marketing for sure. I I wouldn't be able to tell you how a horror film or uh, I don't know, a food documentary works, but I would imagine very much um, similar. Yeah. And again, the more global these people are, the better, right? And the more well-connected and and influencers those people are, the better, right? Because some of the uh, folks in my film have, uh, I don't know, 2 million uh, Twitter followers or you know, it gets easier that way. So do you feel like filmmaking's marketing is unique to itself? Yeah, different aspects of the industry work differently. So, so the B two B side of the industry. So, to to get a, a deal with a German broadcaster, I mean that that's a relationship business, and I've been doing it for ten years, and I actually have a sales agent who's doing a phenomenal job at this as well. Um, so, so that's one side of the business. Then there's another side of the business which is kind of like um the TVOT model, right? When you launch a film, you have a product to sell for ten dollars, let's say, right? Yeah. And then you can do the the standard marketing uh, tricks, right? You 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 run ads on Twitter and Facebook and all that. And I've tried, and you know, I have all these. Um, metrics, like everyone I talk to, like whether it's my PR agent or my, they're always impressed by how um, much metrics I have. Like even Amazon um, now allows you to to advertise, right? And I can literally um, uh, put a value on each click or on each visit, right? And, yeah. and, and you can do that. Um, but I think what you're really asking is something else though. So it's not like selling it as a product. What you're really saying is like the branding, right? So how does Cryptopia like stand above thousands of hours of other crypto related and blockchain related content. And, and that is difficult. It's, it's, um, it's, it's going on podcasts. It's like, uh, you know, being part of that, that community. And, and I don't know whether there's a playbook. I mean, I have, I have my technique, but I don't know whether it would work for everyone. Not everything applies to everyone, but what life hacks have you found in filmmaking where it's like, oh, I had to go A to D and now I can go A to B. Good one. Um, I don't think I don't think um, I've, I've learned uh, like ha- really hacks. I mean, the, the the basic tools are still the same: strong trailer, mm. um, uh, strong uh, key art, right? Um, and uh, you want to have like a Screen Australia or maybe a broadcast attached to it to get get or like famous people in it. I mean, th- this is like none of this is like super <laughs> uh, <laughs> like super uh, hacks or anything. No, sorry. It's just you got to keep grinding. Yeah, that's true. And every filmmaker, every film is different. And I'm sure you're going to ask me about about that as well uh, later on. But but. Um, I think I've I just found my my way of telling a story in my my audience and my my niche and and it kind of works right I have the the right situation sorted out and and things like that. So if you were talking to a young filmmaker and you had to give him one piece of advice, what would you say? If he has never done anything before, he or she, then uh, just start right. And and mm. starting might be um, a, a TikTok uh, you know channel or whatever you, <laughs> yeah. you call it. Um, but but then I I do think so. I mean, one thing to take away from this interview, I think, is really that that uh, positioning and finding your niche and finding your audience, and then relentlessly re- relentlessly focusing on that. Because I mean, if you just do, oh, I- I'm making a horror film, then it's like okay, you're one out of you know, 250 this year. So how is you going to use going to be different? But if you're one out of two you know, Bitcoin uh, movies, you know, that, that is different, right? So, so the smaller your niche and the better you know that niche, the better I would, think, I would say. So finding your niche, you know, in crypto, did you ever plan on being in front of the camera? So first, first film was a relatively low budget. It was a lot of uh, stock footage um, and it was, uh, you know, an, an, an my first try. Second one, we had a proper uh, production crew, proper production budget. Um, and then Michael, my co-director, and uh, he, was, he was so right. It was maybe the best piece of advice I've ever gotten. He said, look, this is your story because you, you're you telling the story from when you we did the first film to now the second film. What did you learn? And and, and people want to know. People want to identify with someone. And then, I, I, you know, I was reluctant for a long time, but it kind of does make sense. And now when I do my next film, it gets even easier because now I have a, you know, not only the track record of two films, I also have a, a reputation and a brand myself, right? So so it, it does become easier. And if you look at a lot of successful documentaries of, of late, you will see that the filmmaker actually put themselves as part of the characters in the film. Even sometimes it's just 
you know, behind the camera. Like, you know, one one crucial question comes from the filmmaker, but but that makes a difference. Even inside job, like the, this this documentary from back then, there's like two two times where the, the filmmaker actually does some something journalistic, and that sets him apart from just a, a regular financial documentary. I think. So what's the next step? What's the next movie? Yeah, I'm working on, on something even bigger. Um, it's not the crypto community, but it's another tech uh, sector, a new industry that's emerging. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm covering an, a, a global story and a controversial industry and the, the financial and, and, and business and economy parts behind it. Um, so yeah, I'm super excited about it, actually, but it's not quite ready to, to be shared. <laughs> that's fair. That, that's, a nice, that's a nice teaser. People will be excited about that. So do you think this explaining of complex materials and really bringing it to the masses, is that going to be your niche for the next 50 years? Yeah, I mean, I, I can only think about uh, from one one project to the next, I don't know about 50 years, but I, I, I do think that kind of works because now I have a, an audience large enough to, to make itself um, uh, sustaining, right? And, yeah. and I, I'm not sure whether Kickstarter is still the way to go. Maybe, uh, you know, NFTs or something else, uh, you know, takes its place. But but at least um, with, with those two films, I have something, um, I, I've built like a, some sort of a, um, yeah, audience. Yeah, and you mentioned before your TV reach and possibly doing, you know, bringing your movies to TVs. Is that kind of a new field when it comes to these documentaries selling to TV stations and whatnot? Well, I think it's the other way around. I think, I mean, uh, document TV has been around longer than than the streamer, so so that's how it started. And there's different recipes and different uh, ways to produce a TV documentary. Um, and now, uh, you know, we think that everything is streaming, but actually, it's, it's the other way around. I, I think the trick is actually to do both at the same time. And, and Cryptopia managed to do uh, and both. And again, I think that might be my playbook for the future. So you have one feature documentary that is kind of for that online audience, but also cut it, have a TV cut um, that that is. A Appealing to an international TV audience. Yeah. Let's go back in time a little bit. I'm curious if you had a time machine and you could go back and tell yourself one filmmaking piece of advice, where would you go and why? Okay, so first of all, if I had a, a time machine, <laughs> I would just buy Bitcoin, right? Okay. In 2014, uh, instead of spending your money on, on the film, I would be a very rich man, yeah. which I'm not. Um, but um, filmmaking advice. Look, I, I think at, at the at, at the time of the first one, I I was just not quite ready, and I didn't have the budget to do anything much better. And I think um, you know, given um, the, my constraints, that was that was perfect. And, and I think a Cryptopia is um, I'm very proud of it. But watching at it now, there's like those two or three little things that still bother me. So I think I would just be a little bit more perfectionist uh, perfectionist about it. And hopefully, my next film will be something that I'm, that that is like frame to frame, kind of um, the way I wanted it, right? No, you can definitely see the development from the first movie to the second movie. Yeah, no, thanks. I mean, that that actually means a lot to me because not many people have watched both yes, or they forgot about the first one. Or But 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 it's nice to have someone like you who knows about filmmaking say that because, um, yeah, it's, it's, it was a huge difference. It was also like eight times bigger budget or something, right? All right. So we've talked to you about the intricacies of the film industry. Let's talk to you as a movie fan. What's your favorite future-based movie where it's like a dystopian, apocalyptic kind of world? Yeah, I mean that one is easy because the Matrix is is dystopia, right? Uh, you could also say utopia in, in in some aspects, but but it's also like so well made and it still stacks up today. Uh, it, it it's um, technically brilliant, but also philosophically. I mean, now we're talking about the simulation theory, uh, you know, and, and all this kind of stuff. And and those guys did this. I don't know, twenty five years ago, twenty years ago. It, it's crazy. So I think that's that that one would be number one on my list for sure. Let's go positive. What's your favorite? The world is going to be better in the future. Movie. Yeah, so I would actually, um, I, I would, I mean, it's it's not a popular one among um, the the filmmaking crowd, but but if you talk about the technology and you know mankind, then I think we have to look at Star Trek. Star Trek is, you know, people don't worry about uh, poverty or like um, uh, social unrest. We are just out there exploring things. You know, we're all scientists and we're all explorers. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I mean, if that's the future, I'm all in, right? That was a very conscientious movie and you know theme in general on that TV show. It's just like yeah, for the betterment of man. Yeah, and, and and it's crazy. Like the, the the first one started in the '60s or maybe early '70s, and uh, yeah, it's it's pretty pretty uh, yeah interesting. What's the most realistic technological movie about the, the future? Um, I'm going to give uh, another unpopular opinion here because the the film wasn't really that good. But recently, um, there was this um, sci-fi movie about at at Astra, um, so about um, uh, space travel and, and things like that. It's something I'm very interested in, you know, sci-fi related. Yeah. And they had this 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 one or two scenes about how um, 
space travel is becoming like like almost like boarding an airplane right and, and it looks like that and and this weekend you know we're going to have uh, um uh, branson you know doing his space thing and then um um uh, jeff bezos in, in uh, next week or something like that so it, it kind of foreshadows that and then it even had like a, a moon base where i don't even know what was going on in the moon base but it was kind of like uh, people were living there and it's just like an outpost so so that one and and another maybe counterintuitive one would be truman show i mean truman show again like like foreshadow this thing that we have like a camera on us and uh, tracking devices on us. Yeah. And we're all kind of like like true men in, in a <laughs> weird way, right? It's, it's, it's fantastic. Ad Astra is fantastic, by the way. I really enjoyed that movie. You know, it's quiet. It's beautiful. James Gray has a very unique command behind the lens. I, I do think so. Actually, I did like it better than but then we shouldn't be too influenced by just, um, you know, one or two reviews on our on, on our Twitter or something. Because, sure. Yeah, it, it had yeah, very a lot of strength. Yeah. Let's say you could be on any film set in all of time. Where are you going and why? Oh, super easy. That that one is the easiest questions, man. <laughs> um, so I'm, my background, so when I started in 2011, 12 with my business, it was all about 3D. Um, and my, my company was called 3D Content Hub. So um, I, I have like that background and I'm still doing a lot of work in virtual reality, um, uh, VR and 360 video. And the one filmmaker who has really... Um, kind of, he, he stood for those kind of filmmaking techniques and innovation was uh, James Cameron. And Avatar was just, I mean, still number two movie of all time. Yep. And he's, he's been producing Avatar 2 and 3, I think, for the last 15 years. Yep. I, don't, I don't know if it's ever going to come out. But they're going to use or they are using some some uh, techniques that, that would be um, stuff that that we will maybe use 20 years in the future because he's always that that far ahead of the game. So do you see VR as being something that's going to come and take a bite of the filmmaking kind of industry? Um, I th- uh, so I'm hugely bullish on, on VR. Um, I, I'm still um, working with a lot of VR filmmakers and I'm, I'm consulting with a few of the big um, platforms. And it's it's already bigger than most filmmakers think. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do not think that it will replace any like sort of traditional, um, you know, f- film and, and streaming and things like that. I think it's additional, just like how computer games are not replacing TV. They're just, you know, a, a new thing for a new um, a generation. So I think it is important for all of us to watch, um, but I'm, I'm not quite sure how it's going to end up. I, I think it's going to be most likely much more um, immersive and interactive. So sort of like, you know, more gamey mm-hmm. rather than, than sit back. But um, I might be wrong on that. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, Avatar 2 will come out and just blow our minds and everyone will run to do VR after that. We'll see. So where can people find your stuff, Torsten? Yeah, so I mean, my, my favorite place um, uh, to point people to is uh, cryptopiafilm.com because uh, that's where I sell uh, the film, you know, for, for a couple bucks, uh, so to speak. Um, but I'm using Film Hub, as I mentioned earlier, and, and they've, they've um, onboarded the film to many, many platforms, including Amazon. So Amazon is probably the, the easiest way to, to, to uh, um, get to my films. Thank you so much for coming. It's been a pleasure. I feel a little bit more educated about crypto. So I just want to say thank you. Thanks for having me. Buy some Bitcoin and watch my film. Thanks. <laughs> Take care. Finding an audience can be the greatest challenge a filmmaker can face. Film Hub is the answer to the distribution problems of the film community. Film Hub has helped countless directors get their projects onto major streaming services. So if you are finding the distribution side of filmmaking a frustrating battle, let the number one film distribution platform do the heavy lifting for you. Thanks for listening. Please subscribe, rate, and review Ford Filmmaker on whatever podcast platform you're using. The smallest gesture makes a world of difference, and we so appreciate it. On the next episode of Ford Filmmaker, we'll be talking with Sweater Rye, director of the Oscar shortlisted documentary, A Pandemic Away from the Motherland, to discuss making a film about a once-in-a-generation public health crisis.